Good morning. So I hope I uh, am worthy of that uh, keynote thing. So uh, I'm from MIT, and my perspective is research. And uh, I um, am going to give you a kind of a long-term perspective, but I believe that what I'm finding in rather sophisticated mathematics plays back exactly to pr daily practice. I also am an advisor at Tamer, uh, and so have experience with data scientists that way. So, whoop, sorry. So, um, <clears throat> as you all know, uh, big data is changing our world, and in the last decade, it's changed our world in amazing ways. But what lies ahead is even more amazing because of the profound changes that it's opening the door to. So, uh, big data, actually, I'm going to, during the talk, I'm going to refer to Michael Jordan, a professor of statistics at Berkeley, who's probably the world leader in some of the sophisticated math mathematics underlying machine learning, statistics, and so forth. And he's been one of the most provocative and uh, biggest contributors to, to big data. He calls big data transformative. It's transforming academia, and it's transforming industry and society, but from the academic point of view, virtually every uh, discipline is, a, is talking of big data as a sub-discipline. So yesterday when people were talking about what is big data, big data is a, di a sub-discipline of almost, um, uh, of every discipline nowadays. So, um, so um, it's, not, it's not about big data. And big data isn't the change. Big data is opening the door to major change, change in processing and change in thinking. So the changes in processing are, aren't the, uh, just the obvious ones from scale. That is, with the volume of data, you have to do bottom-up processing. But, it's, uh, but there's new algorithms that are being introduced from processing, such as machine learning and deep learning, and that's just the beginning. But what's even more profound is different ways of thinking. So it opens the door, uh, and so, so the question is, um, what, what is, uh, this is the, the dull question everybody asks, what is big data? So as a research scientist, I should define big data because it's important for me to understand what it is I'm looking at, and that's indeed what I did at the beginning of my research. But when one, imp when one gives a definition, you impose a model on big data and, the, and constrain what you're looking at to what's within that model. And so I don't want to do that. What I want to do is um, uh, look at more profound things. So almost all of the advantages from big data that most people are familiar with <clears throat> come from scale, volume, velocity, and, and variety. And there's a lot more to come from that. But what's more profound is new ways of thinking. So the new ways of thinking are introducing major opportunities, and that's what I'm going to talk about, and challenges, and that's what I'll conclude with. So, um, the kind, so it's when we're talking about data. Uh, so, big data isn't um, a single thing. It's the uh, the data, the meth the um, analytical methodologies, the models, and the workflows. So, it's a system as a whole, and it's also not a single action. It is a multidisciplinary uh, activity. And so, um, when I'm trying to define big data, why don't we turn to big data to define big data? So two of the profound changes I'll use to give you an insight into what the potential of big data might be. So the first one is listening to data. In principle, it sounds pretty easy, but can anybody here actually say that they can look at data in an unbiased way? It's almost impossible to do that. And so one of the advantages of big data, and mind you, it's limited, uh, because you can't do anything mathematically that is free of a model. But one of the great things that is possible from big data is to use less bias, that is, look into the data and find correlations that seem to be significant and use those as hypotheses. And I'll give you an example of how that applies. What's profound about it are two things with respect to human cognition. One is simplicity or complexity, and that is the human mind, a psychologist tell us, can't deal with more than seven plus or minus two ideas at a time. So the, so the, so the, um, uh, the, the general dogma of biology 
and the standard model of physics are beyond any human being to understand. So how can we do experiments fully within the models like that? So machine learning and deep learning don't have restrictions like that, but, it also has, but they also have limitations as well. So being able to use big data for hypothesis generation overcomes that uh, simplicity complexity barrier and also helps to avoid the bias barrier. Another thing is, as we all know in the real world, there are m multiple ways of looking at things and most analytical methods, certainly databases, the area that I come from, look at one thing at a time. And in fact, databases are based on this notion of a single, uh, a single version of truth. We all know that that's not true. So big data allows a possibility of looking at the same data set with multiple perspectives. And what this leads to is the possibility of something that I've been working on, and it's very exciting. It's called accelerating scientific discovery. So what I'm going to talk about is a motivating problem. That is, there is, well, I'll tell you, this, the motivating question came up about two years ago when the chief scientist of the U.S. Academy of Science, a colleague of mine, called me in with a concern that resources in America, in the Academy of Science in particular, and in U.S. government agencies, were shifting from empiricism to, uh, to data, data analysis. And the question he was raising is, are the kinds of results we come up with empiricism, I'm sorry, the other way around, are the results that come from data analysis as sound, that is, they are not weak and not spurious. Because in science, science has spent uh, hundreds of years trying to ensure what is uh, a causality, what is actually true. So that's the motivating story, and I'll start there. And from there, I'll go to grand opportunities, grand challenges, of which I'll focus primarily on efficacy. And then that will lead me to trying to pronounce some laws and limits of data science. So now let's turn to what, why. In the scientific method, you, you take a phenomenon, you have a hypothesis over that uh, phenomenon, and then, like Ptolemy, you create a model, and in him it was the harmonic, con the harmonic uh, uh, spheres around the, that the cosmic bodies uh, rotated on. You create an experiment, you conduct the experiment, and you test the hypotheses, and they're not exactly right, so you go back to the model, you change the model a bit, and then you go back and experiment again. So this cycle is the scientific method. And once you've proven that the hypotheses that emerge from the model are true empirically, then you have what's called causality. So what does this relate to what and why? So uh, the, the, the analytical side where you have a model is the what. So this is what we do in, in data science. It's what all people do in mathematics. So you ask the question, what? And the, and the answer can only be what might occur. On the other side, in empiricism, they look for causality. That is, why did it occur? And that's important in drug discovery because you want to ensure that the impact you have is correct. So the concern of many people, and the chief scientist of the Academy of Science, is that the growing importance of what may be undermined by the weak and spurious results that come from it. So that's what I'm going to talk about today. So the why side, the empirical side, has about a thousand years of history and a lot of very well worked out uh, disciplines and methodologies. And the holy grail is to find accurate causality. And the methods that were developed, developed over hundreds of years. So this is, this is a book, re a recent book on, on drug discovery. And between 1850 and 1940, what are called now clinical trials developed. At the beginning in 1850, how did you test a drug? Well, you asked your friends. You found somebody in the street who would take a farthing. You found people in insane asylums. And things have changed rather a lot. Well, I'm here to say that big data, although we not be giving it to crazy people, we are at the beginning of developing the methodologies. And that's really the message here. In, um, in, on the what side, of which big data is a major proponent, we've been doing mathematics and modeling for almost a thousand, a thousand years as well. So the history is as long, but it is almost all model-driven. We are now turning to a new area that is called data-driven. Now, the holy grail here is we want the correlations to be meaningful, right? But you all know there's no truth, and there's no such thing as meaning. It's all relative to a system. So we can't go for meaningful. 
what we've got to go for is accurate and, and reliable with respect to some model. Major difference between the two, and I hope everybody knows this, a survey of data scientists in Boston and their customers that I've done over the last year is most people who consume data science have no idea about the distinction between correlation and causation. Scientists make this mistake all the time. So now let's go to the grand challenges, I mean the grand opportunity. And the grand opportunity, like, oh, I didn't tell you that, fun, that really cool slide at the beginning with the cells. That came from the largest scientific project ever funded in Europe, and it's headed out of Lausanne, Switzerland, and it's the Brain Project. And they're attempting to use, uh, amongst other things, um, big data and data analytics to accelerate scientific discovery. And let me give you an example of what that means. So we have a model. We're looking for correlations. And we want to work with our partners in the empirical side and turn those correlations into reality. That is, hey, I think A implies B. And you run an experiment, and you see if A, A in fact does imply B. So here's how it goes. Out of your model, you produce some correlations, hopefully not a billion. Then you give it to your empiric empirical friends, and they test it out. You know, they didn't exactly work. Give me another model. So you go back, and you refine the model a little bit. And this circle is scientific discovery. And what we want to do is, is there a pointer on here? No. Um, what we want to do is we want to accelerate scientific discovery by iterating rapidly through our models using big data and data analytics. And by the way, what is really interesting to me, and I've only just found this out in the last two years, is on the empirical side, they now iterate through there. They have what's called adaptive clinical trials. They don't take a trial to its end. They take a trial, and they look at what's converging and diverging. And then the stuff that's diverging, they drop it. The stuff that's converging, they go over to the, uh, the model people, and they say, hey, could you refine this a little bit? Because I, it didn't work exactly right. So this is, there are many projects that are doing this. Now, let's go to one of these big, these profound changes that we were talking about. So theory-driven is where a human comes up with the hypotheses or the correlations you're going to look for. That's cool, done it for a 1,000 years. What's, what's now cool is the machine comes up with hypotheses. It looks at the data, looks at patterns, sees that they're significant, and says, hey, I think uh, this is good. So here's the trick, and this is one of the, uh, one of the uh, uh, best practices I'm going to talk about later. It is machine-driven, human-guided. And I have a wonderful example. It's called the Baylor-Watson exam. Uh, the Baylor -Wat I call it the Baylor-Watson study. It's just recently been published at the beginning of the year, April, in the CKDD conference. So Watson, they were looking for cures for cancer having to do with something called a kinesis for the P53 protein. What did they do? They had Watson look at 240,000 um, abstracts, the entire corpus of, of papers written on this topic. Really cool. Watson reduced it to 70,000. From the 70,000, constructed a model of the kinases. Now, how did the model get constructed? The scientists did it, not Watson. And so, anyway, the long story short, I'll, I'll tell you the verification thing, which was really cool. They, they speculated there might be 500 or so of these kinases. In actual fact, there are 259 that are known. So they were looking for novel ones beyond the 259. They found nine. I, I, Watson found... Working together, they found nine. But here's the cool trick. They did the analysis up till 2003. That's when they found the nine. They then went and looked at the literature, and of the nine, they found that seven had already been discovered. This is called retrospective verification. That raised their confidence in the two. Now what are they going to do with the two? Anybody? What do you think they're going to do with the two? Yes. Agnostics. What? Agnostics. Agnostics. Yeah. Diagnose, well, clinical studies, right. They're gonna, so this is the rule. This is correlation doesn't mean causation. So what they did, they worked with it very carefully to get it um, to, to reduce the number of possibility humans working with the machine to come up with a small number. And now they have two, and they know there's a high probability because of this analysis these things might actually work. Now they're going to go through the clinical trials. So this is the lesson to be learned. So the grand challenge... 
and this may be something you may not be familiar with on a day-to-day -day basis, is we are just at the beginning of big data. We've got much more than a decade to go. And to quote Michael Jordan again, he says that it is not just a profound challenge of engineering and mathematics. You don't just cobble this stuff together. Use a bit of AI, use a bit of machine learning, use a bit of statistics. So maybe that works, but we don't know. So I'm going to just quickly list three areas that I'm working on, and I'll just focus on the third one. The first one is efficiency. I guess the way to say this is expressing uh, data-intensive discovery as an, as an experiment and then running it uh, in, in, the, in the language of the people who want to solve the problem, let's say a scientist, and then running it in the optimal way in the, in the hardware. This is more than a decade's work. We heard yesterday, hey, you can use Hadoop, you can use R. I didn't hear scal uh, 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 LAPAC or uh, SCALAPAC, which are the high-end processing for dense matrices, but most scientific studies are not dense, they're sparse. Anyway, just to give you an idea, this, getting this stuff working efficiently, it's a decade. The next thing is open data. It has been a policy of many governments and many companies that they share data, that I can use your data in a knowledgeable way. I've got to find it, I've got to understand it, I've got to import it, I've got to clean it, and I've got to analyze it under the hypotheses that you used when you produced the data. This is more than a decade away. I'm going to focus on efficacy. Efficacy is what they measure when you apply a drug in a clinical trial. If, a, if drug A has an impact of reducing this particular symptom, then you've also got to check the null hypothesis, which is a placebo. Pretty easy, right? So we have a marketing plan. Um, we think that uh, strawberry popsicles will increase sales. Good, all right. What's the null hypothesis there? Not strawberry? Neutral flavor? So it's complicated. How you do the design uh, when you're trying to... Oh, so what is efficacy? Efficacy is a... You have to start with a hypothesis of what you're pursuing, and then you've got to define what accuracy means. That is, when you get a result, how do you measure that that result is accurate with respect to your hypothesis? So this is a challenge. Uh, so Michael Jordan says half. Oh, good. Now I'll relax. So I'll tell you what I did last summer. <laughs> no, um, so Michael Jordan says, together with these other pronouncements of the challenges we're facing, it's now time to look at the principles. So that's what I've been doing now for two years, and I boldly call it data science at scale. So here is my approach. Data science at scale is to data discovery, big data stuff we do, as the scientific method is to scientific discovery. Pretty simple. That is, all I do is reframe all of the concepts, tools, and techniques from scientific method and put it into data science. And so that the, 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 the empirical model in the scientific method become the basic principles of data science. What does that mean? That means that every single data intensive activity I do is an experiment. It has hypotheses, randomization, p-values. P-values is what you use in science to determine accuracy. And every domain has their own values. And by the way, science has questioned p-values for a long time. So what I'm trying to tell you, this isn't simple. But it is cool, because this actually seems to work. So this has led me to what I'm going to conclude with, some laws and limits of data science. So the first law of data science is that the meaning of a correlation requires empirical verification. We already had that from that table over there, so that, that's good. What is seldom enough? That something might have occurred is seldom enough. That's why you've got to verify. But as it turns out, why is not always needed. If a truck's coming down the street, you don't care about to hit you. You don't care why it's coming down the street. You want to get out of the way. So there's a balance there of how you spend resources depending on the impact of having made a decision from your correlation. Best practice number one, all data-intensive activities should be efficacy-driven. Efficacy-driven means you have hypotheses, so I'm going to try to determine something. What is it? Tell me what it is. And by the way, to be precise, 
what is the, the counter hypothesis or the null hypothesis? And those aren't easy. In science, it's called a scientific design or empirical design. Bloody hard stuff. This data science stuff is not easy stuff. It's very powerful and can be very damaging if you use it incorrectly. So one of the things we hear in data science an awful lot is, or I'm sorry, in big data a lot, is getting answers really quickly. Lots of answers really quickly. What the hell does it mean that you get it quickly if you can't even tell whether it's right or wrong or spurious or weak? The primary focus is the potential that the correlation is true in reality. Second law of data science. And this one comes when, with, with animated chats with Gregory Piotrowski Shapiro. And it is that causality can be determined from correlations only by community accepted mechanisms and metrics. So remember I said a moment ago, you just have to verify it. Well, if I go off and verify and say, I'm done, what do you think of that? Right, <laughs> maybe not. So the issue is that we all have to agree what the metrics are within our domain, marketing, uh, drug discovery, clinical trials, whatever it is. And then we have to prove it with respect to that, with transparency. The limit, now this is the kicker, this is where I'm ending. You can read that on your own. We don't know where our tools break. This is what Michael Jordan says. This is what a number of leading statisticians, machine learning, and other people say. That is to say, when we apply our tools, statistics, let's say statistical significance, when we apply statistical significance in small data, we know what we're doing. We've had, well, the statisticians tell us what we're doing. We've had 100, about 100 years of doing that. Let's scale up. Let's take the, um, a person as a table with n attributes, and you want to look at you know, combinations of attributes, n choose 1, n choose 2, n choose 3, n choose blah, 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 n choose n. And then you want to do cofactor variance on across them all, all pairs. This is, this is something you don't compute easily. And what and Michael Jordan claims, it is highly likely in a very large data set that every single correlation will come up significant according to the way we compute statistics. So back to what he said. It is not big data and data science is not simply a matter of cobbling together what we know in the small data world. We have to pursue this and understand it. So Michael Jordan was asked, what happens if our community doesn't concern itself with this accuracy? And he said in a rather dramatic way, well, we'll have a big data winter. That is to say, people will begin to find that the correlations that come out of this community are unsubstantiated or have caused serious harm. Patients die, drugs have maleffects, and they're going to say, hey, wait a minute, this stuff doesn't work. But there is a way out, folks. Best practice number two, experiment like hell and put error bars on absolutely everything. Those two go together, right? It is this empirical approach to data science. You have a hypothesis. You have a, 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 an expectation of accuracy. You, how do you do accuracy? This is not easy. With training sets, that's cool, but you impose a model. Now, what happens when you use deep learning at orders of magnitude of billions, and you haven't used a training set? How do you know what's true, what's not true? You have no ground truth. So you see why it's going to take a decade. So common practice. I talk to a lot of data scientists, and they basically fall into two classes. One saying, uh, what, why? And they say, well, our customers never ask for error bars. So I guess we could. Then there's the other class, the guys who I think execute best practice. There are two types. And they say, they say, the vast majority of our customers have no idea they don't care. But because we are data scientists and we want to do the right thing, we put error bars on everything so that we know that we're delivering an, a, an answer that is approximate with respect to the error bars. And the two classes of people are machine learning. And in my gym in Somerville, so there, are, there are three data scientists, and they've been doing this for years. They say, what's, what's the big deal? Well, they're particle physicists who couldn't get a job in particle physics, and now they're in data science. So they grew up thinking exactly in this way. Best practice number two, machine-driven, human, so machine human-guided. And we saw that in the Baylor-Watson thing. 
And I advise a company called Tamer, and everything we do in big data, we do data curation, and all the data curation mechanisms use machine learning. And we always, uh, it's always machine driven, it comes up with all kinds of possibilities. And, we, and the machine gives a level of confidence as to every result that it comes out with. And the human expert says, hey, you're pretty good on, you know, you test it for a while, so you're pretty good on this one. At 0.75, and, and above, you go ahead. Below 0.75, come to me and ask me, and we go to our experts. Now, um, let me see, what's the next? Yeah, right. So my common practice is not so much. So here's what I did. I did a research study of data curation. So I advised Data Tamer. It does data curation at scale. I found 65 products that do some amount of data curation. The, the prototypical tool says... They want ease of use, which is cool, and they want self-service. That is, they want the analyst to be able to use the tool. So, hey, you know, just formulate your hypothesis or your, or your study, and, and we'll go get the data and curate it for you. How the hell can they do that? The point is, you've got to look at the data and make decisions. Is it right? Is it wrong? How do I correct it? What the, what are the, where did you get the data from? Is the data continuous? Or is there data missing? A uh, machine can't figure this stuff out. You need a human. So in Boston, when people do these impossible things, we call it wicked smart. At, 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 at MIT, we call it AI complete, <laughs> i.e., you can't do it. So those 65 or so products are need to learn. So in conclusion, big data is changing our world with opportunities like finding drugs far fa orders of magnitude faster than we found them historically and making scientific discoveries and solving really complex problems more than we've ever, faster than we've ever done before, orders of magnitude more. But there are grand challenges. And I guess the best way is to quote Michael Jordan and simply say, it's not a matter of just cobbling together what we know. It's fundamentally, it is profoundly different. So it's a 10-year evolution. My approach and that of many others, in fact, I saw one posted on a data science web yesterday saying just exactly this thing. Take a scientific approach to data analysis. And then it came out with the laws of data science. Correlation must be verified. Verification must be with respect to accepted norms. And the best practices drive your data science or your activities uh, uh, with efficacy, that is hypotheses and correctness. Experiment like hell, put error bars on everything, and use humans in the loop. So... The big message here is we, I'm speaking from the research community's point of view, stuff that is done at scale, and we don't know where on this growth of scale, whether it's volume, uh, uh, variety, complexity, it's probably in the variety domain more, but we don't know where the mathematics breaks down. So your protection is to put error bars in everything. Thank you. Uh, very great talk. Thank you so much. Thank uh, you. Yesterday I picked up the magazine uh, published by Oracle that's available in the fifth floor. One of the articles, the very first paragraph says that with big data, you don't need any error bars. You don't, what? you don't need any error bars? No error bars because it's big data. And this is the very first paragraph of the article, and I really want uh, the whole community to know whether it is a BS or whether it's truth. <laughs> I have two PhDs. I, I work in mathematics. I work in computer science. And I try to be careful with what I say. I'm not selling anything. After I walk out the door, you can't run up and say, hey, will you consult for me? I don't do that. So that's one point. Um, Oracle also said, and as did IBM and all the others, that there is only a single version of truth in the world. And all our databases operate that way. This is also false. So um, I'm not going to comment on Oracle, um, but I am going to tell you that you need error bars on everything. And if you can't put an error bar on it, maybe you don't know what you're doing. Does that sound reasonable? That if you go to your boss and say, you know, A implies B. I know that. He says, oh, great. Let's go and implement it. It's a drug, and it affects people. 
and they die. Can you be sure that they're going to die or not? Do you, th- do you th- just to continue a little bit on that topic, do you think that the idea that, oh, we don't need error bars comes from, the, comes from well, we have all these observations, central limit theorem, you know, we're go- we, you know, we, we have uh, sorry, norm- sorry, normality. Sorry, sorry, <laughs> it doesn't work. Is that, is that it, where that thinking is coming from? Yeah, it is. It, I believe it does. So, so even in mathematics, we're attempting to look at those kinds of trends. That is to say, you come up with a correlation, and then you cross-correlate. There's, there are a thousand mechanisms in statistics to do cross-validation and just that sort of stuff. What they're attempting to do is they are not attempting to prove causality. They're attempting to raise your confidence that it is likely to be causal. But flipping over is a fatal flaw that Oracle has obviously made. But you're right. So your intuition is, God, I, I know how they've done this for 20 years. So it's definitely the case. OK, so if it's definitely the case and it's so goddamn obvious, just prove it. it must be pretty simple, right? Prove your stuff. I can. Can you do that? Yes, yes we can. Yeah, I can. It is. Oh, that's exactly what it is. Thank you. So we can make one and how long have we known overfitting? We've known overfitting ever since the beginning of statistics. The question is, overfitting at scale is highly probable. Overfitting the other way depends on how you model. But it's almost inevitable at scale. <laughs> Excellent. Um, quick question here. It's, and this is a naive question. Um, you mentioned something about efficacy. Ah, yes. yes. So uh, some of this come from the drug discovery background. Um, Be- besides efficacy, what we actually look for is safety. And if you have people who have seen in the popular press... Those are correlated, obviously. Because if you define your efficacy that you have a particular effect, you bloody well better make sure that that effect is safe. That is to say, there are no other implications. But given the complexity of a biological system... Ah, uh, yeah, 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 you're right, you're right. Sorry, <laughs> I take it back. Okay. You're absolutely right. There's absolutely right. no way to make that underpinnings empirical. Yeah, so can I, can I just say to those who don't come from science and drug discovery, the, so you have this model of E equals MC squared. Hey, that, discard, that, that defines, you know, use Occam's razor to define some physical property. But as it turns out, the hypothesis is, from my point of view and probably others, is the world is far more complex than even the standard model of physics. It's way more complex. So when you produce a drug and you have a particular effect and you've proven that the placebo is five standard deviations away so you're safe, what about all the other things which you didn't test? You don't know. And you cannot conclude. Sorry, that's a... I like to be a little bit dramatic, but it's true. It's true. Thank you. You're welcome. 